to make a wretched treasure. How great the pain of seeing loss. The Father turns his face away. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord be with you and also with you. Good morning. My name is John McDougall, and I'd like to welcome you here to Liberty Main Line on this Trinity Sunday. And unlike other dates on the liturgical calendar, Trinity Sunday refers to a church doctrine rather than a specific event like Easter or Christmas. It's a day when we celebrate God's being as part of the whole, as the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please join me, please rise and join me in this call to worship found on page one. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lives among us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. To the one who God be praise in all time and places through the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we praise and celebrate the glory of the eternal Trinity. We thank you for the grace that even allows us the ability to contemplate your unfathomable mystery your being. We praise you for being a loving Father. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has cleared the way for an intimate relationship with you. And we gratefully receive the power of the Holy Spirit through which you move and work within us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please remain standing. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him.
be seated. Hear this call to confession found on page three. Happy are those who trans, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. It feels pretty good when our sins are forgiven. When we do something that maybe hurts someone deliberately or just accidentally and we carry the guilt of it and there's something so freeing about having that person say, I forgive you, it's done, it's in the past. And when you think about how we compare to God, we really mess up a lot. We hurt him accidentally, deliberately. And yet he shows no withholding when it comes to forgiving us and loving us. Please join me in this prayer of confession. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thought of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Let's take a few moments to silently confess our sins.
Glory be to the Father. Glory be to the Son. Glory be to the Spirit. Three in one. As it was in the beginning. Please stand to receive these words of pardon. God relieves us of our burdens and rescues us in our distress. In Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Okay, please remain standing. Out of my bondage, sorrow and Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my wanting, and into thy wealth, out of my sin. be seated. I have just one quick announcement. I know that um, we feel like this weekend is really the official start to summer for many of us, but next weekend on um, Sunday after church, we will be having our kind of our summer send-off connect lunch. So make plans to stay after the service, and um, we'll have one final gathering together as a group before we break for the summer.
And we do need some helpers with this Connect lunch. Right now, we don't have anyone to spearhead it. The food is provided. So we just need a point person to um, connect with the caterers as they deliver the food, and then maybe just a couple of people to help set up or um, help with communion supplies. You can look at the website, or you can contact Jordan if you're interested. And let me say that we are an equal opportunity congregation, and so men, feel free to sign up. <laughs> okay. okay. Other than that, yeah, man. <laughs> so... Other than that, um, let's stand up to pass the peace to each other. And children, you are free to go. Good morning, Liberty Church. It's good to see you as we gather for worship this morning. If, we, if you're visiting today and I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is uh, Matt. I'm pastor here and would love to uh, take a moment to say hello after the service. If you're able, it would be great to connect. As we continue our uh, service this morning, we have been this uh, spring working through uh, a letter of Paul to a church in the city of Philippi. Uh, so if you are following along in the worship folder or your copy of God's Word, we're going to look this morning at chapter 2. Uh, this is uh, starting at verse 19. This is the living Word of the living God, so I invite you to listen as we hear uh, His own voice through His Word. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. I'll seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will also come soon. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I'm very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious." Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, as we now hear from you, we ask that you'd use my words and your word and your Holy Spirit would be present so that whatever the circumstances or situations each of us today might be facing, might be experiencing, might have recently experienced, pray that we'd be encouraged by your presence with us, the one who works <clears throat> and is close and uh, also works and serves us through one another. Father, we thank you ultimately that we enjoy and know your love and care and concern through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we pray we'd remember him well and be encouraged in him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, the past couple of weeks, 
we've been looking at one of the most famous and beautiful passages in the Bible about Jesus, a passage so lyrical about Jesus' journey from glory to grit back to glory again for the sake of men and women like you and me, that it may possibly preserve one of the earliest Christian worship songs to and about Jesus. And Paul either quoted or composed that passage to summon followers of Jesus to reflect him in their own lives together with one another as they live in the neighborhoods of their communities. Paul summons uh, followers of Jesus to have the mind or the mindset of Jesus wherever they are, or as we put it here at Liberty, that we seek to live, speak, and serve as the very presence of Jesus for our communities. Now, in comparison... Today's passage is not especially well known. You may never have read this before. Probably it's not frequently memorized. Uh, This is not a especially famous passage. We go from top shelf theology into what feels like kind of a mundane travel itinerary. And yet here it is in the Bible. So what's it doing there? This passage is intended to bring those lofty principles of following Jesus and then putting them into the everyday world of highways and prisons and church bookkeeping and travel. And Paul does that by providing two examples of a Jesus mindset or a Jesus lifestyle. He gives the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus And these two people give us some specific and simple ways that we ourselves can be the presence of Jesus in our own relationships and communities. In Jesus, we see this humble glory that we looked at a couple weeks ago, and that sets a pattern for us of humble work that we looked at last week. And so here we now see two examples of humble workers, people that we could try to be like as we all try to be a little bit like Jesus for one another. So the first of those is Timothy. Paul wants to send Timothy largely because Paul himself can't visit the Philippian church. He's in prison. It's probably like house arrest. And uh, Timothy's presence with him is vital as someone who is free to assist and support Paul while he's detained. And yet, Paul is eager and willing to send Timothy to visit them as soon as possible, not because he needs to fix a bunch of problems there in that community, but in order to gather a good report to bring it back to Paul to encourage him about what God's doing among them. Timothy's character makes him especially suited for this task. Paul describes him as a spiritual son and then actually shifts metaphors mid-sentence, making both of them fellow servants. They serve together, both working for one master, the Lord Jesus. We could even say that Timothy is Paul's soul brother. There's actually, uh, in the Greek vocab, two soul-based words that Paul uses. He expects Timothy's report back to encourage him or the literally good soul Paul, or perhaps we could say gladden his soul or lift his spirits. Have you ever sat through one of those tedious slideshows of a trip and you couldn't wait for it to be over? You're like, this must have been fantastic for you, but you have made it murderously boring. (laughs) That's not the type of report that Timothy brings. When Timothy updates you and shares stories, it's good for the soul. Timothy and Paul are also like-minded or more literally like-souled. And specifically in Timothy's greatest character quality, which is a genuine concern for others. He's focused on the interests of others, not his own, which is a key component of the Jesus-like mindset that Paul had urged us to follow earlier. Uh, As I was reflecting on this passage, I happened to be at the convention center in Atlantic City. And strangely, the, the convention center was like a ghost town most of the time we were there. So as we're going through, Rebecca turns and whispers to me, "Sounds like it looks like the zombie apocalypse is here. Um, and despite there being hardly anyone there, to get from our parking in the convention center to our hotel, I think there were conservatively 24 sets of doors that I had to go through, carrying bags and stuff like that. So I'm going back at one point to our hotel room after having dropped some things off in the car. And uh, the only other two people in the entire thing are this dad and son who look like they're carrying an entire team's worth of 
snacks. Uh, the dad has a stack, and the top of the stack of things that the dad is carrying is a case of about 36 bottles of water. And so I'm very pleased with myself, because as we're about to start going through the series of 24 doors, I zip in front of him, and then I, I start opening the doors in front of him. Now, very proud of myself, right? Uh, the next day, of course, we uh, have to clear out of our room, and so I'm bringing our luggage back to the car, so my hands are full. And there's two people coming toward me through one of the doors, uh, sets of doors. One of them's in a wheelchair. But I'm like, you know, I'm carrying all these bags, and there's somebody to help him navigate those doors, right? A little, little bit of a reality check on my uh, Good Samaritan instincts. To use the language of this passage, it was easy for me to look out for somebody else's interests when my hands were empty, but it was hard to do when I literally felt the weight of my own family's interests. Not just the baggage, but the meal times and the pressure of the tournament start times uh, and the uncertainty of the day to come. So as that thought continued to percolate on one of my 14 trips through 24 doors, um, the, the thought that I had is that there's two times that we can look out for the interests of others around you. And one of those is when our hands are empty. If your life is in a quiet patch, a low-stress season, praise God. Um, and if you're here, we'd love to give you some things to do. Uh, <laughs> joking. But uh, that means that you're also in a great season to help out others around you. But Paul doesn't just describe this as like an optional thing for a season of life, right? So how do we do this in those hands full, carrying luggage, or should I say carrying lots of baggage, seasons of life? Well, to help somebody else through those doors when I was carrying my own bags, I would have had to set down my own stuff. And through Paul, God is telling us that when we're feeling overloaded, it could be that one of the healthiest, most soul-refreshing things for us to do would be to help somebody out and starting by putting down some of your own stuff for a bit. Open a door for somebody else to, help, to uh, squeeze this illustration until it's dry. Because the best way to carry a lot of weight is for everyone to do a little. In fact, uh, another point at the tournament, participants um, were, were actually breaking hundreds of pounds of wood and uh, cement blocks. Uh, and it started all in the corner. I thought like they were about to have a construction site. It all started in a corner of uh, the convention hall. Uh, but to move all of that material to uh, the, the, um, the stage, uh, what did these incredibly strong martial arts contestants do? They didn't just like get down and shoulder a whole bunch of stuff. They formed a line so they could each pass one item at a time. Because when a community of people all practice other-centered care, everyone receives care and support, and a lot gets done by everybody doing a little bit. And sometimes... Some of us get frustrated because we get this attitude or practice half right. And let me explain what uh, I'm talking about. You're looking out for others all the time. You're working hard. You're serving your family members or maybe your employees or friends or fellow Christians. But you don't let others do the same for you. So you're frustrated because you never let anyone help you or ask anyone for help. And I get that because 100% of the time, that's usually me. But if you only ever do half of this, the giving out without the receiving back, of course, you're going to end up depleted and bitter. If we all look to the interests of others, we all receive care and support, and that's the logic of God's kingdom community in Jesus, which Timothy models in something as simple as a trip, a visit, and an encouraging report back between friends who, because of life circumstances, can't connect with each other themselves. But before Paul sends Timothy, he first is going to send Epaphroditus. 
Interesting guy. This is his one cameo appearance in the Bible. We can deduce that he was a highly trusted member of the church in Philippi. His name means something like charming. And he may have been the first person in his family to become a Christian. At the very least, his parents were probably pagans when he was born, as his name means from Aphrodite, um, which apparently was a a very common name. But uh, Aphrodite, of course, is the Greek goddess of love. So it's kind of like too much information, all right? But Paul piles up these titles for Epaphroditus, including that of co-worker. And that reminds us of last week's passage where God is a worker who creates us to work. And Paul and Epaphroditus together work in building up churches, whether you're someone like Paul who starts churches full time, strengthens them through leadership development, ongoing theological and practical training, or somebody like Epaphroditus who's probably not a professional minister, who's financially responsible and trustworthy, who does business travel, and who does um, prison ministry uh, to prisoners like Paul. He's also a fellow soldier, which echoes what Paul said earlier about Timothy and Paul who serve. Now, what's distinctive about servants and soldiers is they don't choose their own work. They do the assignments that are given to them by others, whether a household master or commanding officer. Now, we are all proud Western individuals, and we think and feel no one's in charge of me. But there can be great comfort in simply doing work that God has clearly given us to do. Uh, When Rebecca and I were finishing grad school, right, like the, the sky's the limit, all the options are on the table. We're sending out applications to colleges and churches all over the map. And a lot of them sounded pretty fun. I remember one church was hiring that was in Honolulu. That seemed like a really tough place to serve Jesus. Um, Rebecca saw a job posting in Vancouver and thought like, oh, I've never been there. That city sounds uh, like a cool place to be. And I remember specifically thinking uh, after she shared the opening in Vancouver, I was like, what would be like the opposite of Vancouver, right? And uh, ironically, we ended up in a small town in Western Pennsylvania, which was pretty close to the opposite of Vancouver. Uh, But as we were serving there for a number of years, I realized that uh, God had orchestrated our family and work situations. So it's not like we would have picked it off of a map like a vacation destination, but it was obvious that God had called us there. And there was a certain freedom in having received those deployment orders and not in a bad way. Sometimes God gives us assignments. In fact, we had friends while we were there, and um, uh, f- these friends, the husband's sister died of an opioid overdose, and she left behind her, her husband and three teenage children. So our friends, as the aunt and uncle, began deeply investing in the lives of their niece and their nephews. You know, sometimes there's limitless needs in the world and it can be kind of overwhelming. What am I supposed to do if I feel like I'm supposed to serve around me? But sometimes God makes it very obvious and kind of gives us an assignment that we have something to do in a season of life, like our friends with their niece and their two nephews. But one of the quirks of this letter is how over the top Paul is in praising Epaphroditus. He's probably the carrier of this letter, and it helps to understand the circumstances for why Paul is so effusive, because uh, Paul um, had received the original uh, visit from Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had been sent by the church in Philippi to give a financial gift. As a prisoner, Paul couldn't work, but he was still financially responsible to provide for himself. And so Epaphroditus uh, was also apparently supposed to then stay with Paul to assist or support him during his imprisonment, like Timothy's doing, perhaps with his ongoing legal process or in other ways. Apparently, on the way to Paul, Epaphroditus got sick, and the message about Epaphroditus' sickness got back to the church in Philippi. They didn't realize how desperately sick he got at the time, But because Epaphroditus was so devoted to completing this task of getting funds to Paul, he risked his own life, as Paul says, whether pushing on and traveling while sick or risking hazardous traveling conditions. And it's a little speculative, but we could guess that uh, some of the reasons Paul gives Epaphroditus such a glowing recommendation, because remember, the church themselves, he's part of their church, so it's not like they don't know him. 
His character is so good that they entrusted this task to him. So the, one of the reasons Paul gives this glowing recommendation as he returns could have been because uh, things hadn't gone quite as expected. And when plans don't go quite as expected, sometimes we start to kind of ask questions, right? Raise some doubts, uh, especially when the change in plans is because of circumstances outside of our control, like a matter of health and sickness. Because in those circumstances, it's so easy, especially if it was somebody else's job to do, to uh, start asking questions like, Epaphroditus, right? You had one job, right? You got sick? Did you remember to take your multivitamins during the trip? Did you remember to wear your warm hat and the good socks? Could you tell it was going to be rainy on day 11 of that three-week trip to Rome? And then also, oh, Epaphroditus, you're back already. We sent you to stay there. What are you doing back? So Paul goes out of his way to commend Epaphroditus for going above and beyond to complete his assignment, even at the risk of his health. And he says, hold people like him in honor. In other words, recognize and thank a person who, like Epaphroditus, serves others. We have countless days on our calendar, our national calendar, to recognize different types of people. This weekend, we have a Memorial Day to remember military personnel who died while serving in the armed forces. We have Veterans Day, totally different day to honor military veterans. Mother's Day and Father's Day, we recognize parents who feel like combat veterans sometimes. But Paul is reminding us to honor and recognize people who sacrifice to serve others for Jesus' sake. Here at Liberty Mainline, that might be an elder or a deacon or a Bible study leader or a home group leader or Liberty Kids volunteer or a volunteer who sets out uh, a meal for Connect Lunch, which could be you, uh, but gives all of that up for us when they could instead be resting or spending time with family or maybe even just getting a little bit further ahead on work. It might be someone who spends extra time calling or texting a friend or neighbor to check in, the, in with them or to help them with a meal or an errand. And what Paul's saying is, you know what, do all of those things go as planned? No, they don't. But rather than being critical or nitpicky, honor those who look out for others and not just themselves. Recognize them, thank them, and that kind of habit developed within a community of gratitude will spill out into the rest of our life and relationships. And as we honor men and women who serve others at personal cost, we're honoring God who made them to reflect himself. When Timothy was willing to go on a mission for the sake of others at the request of Paul, his spiritual father, he was reflecting the life of the son who is willing to go on a mission for the sake of others as part of his father's plan. And when Epaphroditus risked his life to pro provide relief to Paul in his imprisonment, he was reflecting Jesus who gave up his life to rescue us from our captivity to sin and evil and death. And in a world where we all struggle with self-concern and self-absorption and all of the mental health uh, problems that come with that, Jesus has revealed the heart of God, which is a heart for others and a heart for you and for me. This is the good news in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord and our Father, we thank and praise you for uh, these uh, examples uh, that are preserved in your word uh, of people who sacrificed and served others. We thank you for our own long lists of people in our lives who have sacrificed and served and helped us. And we pray that as we do uh, seek to serve others, that we would not uh, be sucked into the uh, false vision that somehow that puts us in a better place with you, but instead remember that because you have already served us in Jesus, we're actually freed 
to be generous with our time and our attention with others around us. We thank you and praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this point in the service, we remember God's service to us in the person of Jesus. So I invite you to stand together as we confess the faith. Let us say what we believe. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, as we come to this table, we not only memorialize and remember Jesus, but this is a time when we actually receive a new of the presence of Jesus in our lives. So as we come to this table, I invite you f- uh, to join us as we celebrate and thank God for her, his service to us. The band and I will lead in the portions printed in plain font, and I invite you to join together in the portions printed in bold. The Lord be with you. So lift up your hearts now. Let us give thanks to the Lord our saving God. It is right. and right it is in our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, Almighty and Everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and you preserve us by your providence, but you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Say, Holy, 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 God of power and might, the whole earth is full of your glory, Hosanna in the Remember, in this supper, the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith.
your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things in Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Praise to the Father, praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, our God the Three-in-One. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given the thanks, he broke it said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it, all of you, in memory of me. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it, all of you, in memory of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes again for us. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us A few words of instruction for how we participate in the table here at Liberty Church Mainline. Uh, when you're ready, you can come forward. You can tear off a piece of bread and dr dip it in one of the cups. The taller cup is wine. The shorter cup is grape juice. We do have individually packaged and gluten-free elements as well that are available upon request. And we do invite you to this table if you are one who is a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be a member of Liberty Church Mainline in particular. This is where we reflect our unity together around Jesus. If you are here today and you're not somebody who yet identifies as a follower of Jesus, we're so grateful for your presence. Thank you for being here on this Memorial Day Sunday. Uh, and we don't want you to feel pressure to participate in a part of the service that doesn't reflect your own convictions yet. But we do want you to feel uh, ways you can participate. There are prayers for reflection that are in the worship folder on page 8 that might uh, be appropriate for where you find yourself at your uh, point in your own spiritual life currently. Uh, or you could come forward and it'd be my honor to pray for God's blessing over you. You can just cross your uh, arms instead of taking the elements. With that, I'll invite Celie to come forward to help me serve. And these are uh, the gifts of God for the people of God. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He would give His only Son to make the wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face to as wounds which mark the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Christ, 
His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His words have been my rest. One of the ways that we carry burdens for one another is by praying for each other. So at this point, we will join together in prayers of the people. I will offer three short prayers, and I invite you to join in affirming them. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, you can respond, hear our prayer. God, our Father, you are the God of life and healing and also the God who draws close to comfort us when we walk through the shadow of death. We pray for the healing of our sick and hurting friends and family and also for your presence and comfort for those approaching the end of their days here on earth. We think especially this morning of the DiCamilla family as Bianca's grandmother, Georgia, receives hospice care. We pray that in your timing, you would receive her as your daughter and give her rest and new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This Memorial Day weekend, we remember the men and women who have fallen in service to our country. Keep us mindful of the freedoms we enjoy because of the sacrifice of others and help us use those freedoms, not simply for self-indulgence, but for one another's good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And remind us that even if we may live far from battlefields, we live every day on the battle line between the kingdom of God and the spiritual powers of this evil age. Help us to stand in Christ's strength, speed the day when war will be no more, when all may lay down their weapons and Satan himself will be shackled and banished. We yearn for the reign of the peace of Christ when all who have died in him, whether soldier or civilian, will rise to new life. So should we join together with the church throughout the ages to pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray when we do not know what to pray for, as the Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We also always remind one another that part of the worship we offer is to return a portion of what the Lord gives uh, to us to support his worship and to support the service and need of one another and our neighbors and our community. You can uh, follow the QR code in the worship folder to learn how you might do that online. Through the love of God, our Savior, all will be well. Free and change, this is His favor, all is well. Precious is the blood that heals us, perfect is the grace that seals us, strong the hand strength forth. Though we pass through tribulation, all will be well. Such a full salvation, all is well. Happy still in God confiding, fruitful if in Christ alone.
And now as you go, receive the blessing of God's word spoken to you and over you. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.